All right. We are live. This is my first um, attempt at live streaming, and I'm just going to start and uh, assume folks will uh, jump in, and then we'll have this video saved uh, on our uh, on our page on Facebook uh, for EIC Town. But uh, we are continuing our sermon series on kind of the essentials of Christian faith. So a good time to listen in. Uh, for those who are uh, who have been walking with us, and especially as uh, we are in the series uh, season of confinement, what better thing to focus on in a season of confinement than the essentials of being a disciple of Jesus? And so uh, today, uh, Pastor KJ has asked me to teach on um, a very important uh, theme in Scripture. And that is the, the theme and topic of worship. And to do this, I mean, there's so many, so many different passages I could go to, different ways I could approach it. And I thought, uh, as he said a few weeks ago, uh, God gives us story. And often we learn so much from story, and he has a purpose in using stories to stick with us deep in our hearts. And one of the greatest stories in the New Testament, I think, related to worship is found in John's Gospel. Uh, chapter 4, in a chance encounter that Jesus has with a woman at Jacob's well, uh, who is a Samaritan. So I want to invite you to go ahead and turn there. We're going to um, kind of walk through the story. And what I'm going to do is really very simple. I'm going to try to just read and kind of comment as I go. And again, I want, I want, to, I want us to just appreciate this uh, for the, the storyline and, and what is happening and I'll try to make that clear. So I invite you, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn it or go on the browser to uh, John's Gospel, chapter 4. And we're going to look through verses 1 through 30 with this uh, story as we look at what can we learn about biblical worship uh, from the woman at the well. So let me pray for us. And so glad you guys can join. And I will pray for us and we'll, we'll jump right in. So, Father, thank you for... Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to use technology to uh, to look at your word together and God to uh, study it and to uh, talk about it. Understand, uh, Lord, these uh, big essential uh, realities, Lord, that you have created us for. You've created us for worship. Lord, we were made in your image to be worshipers in spirit and truth. And Jesus reveals that to us in this story and reveals it to a woman who has great need, who has a, a past and who needs to hear about this living water. And Lord, we need to hear about this living water. So I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts, open our eyes as we hear your word. And let us hear the voice of Jesus here, inviting us to the feast, inviting us to quench our thirst uh, in you alone, O oh Lord. It's in his name we pray and ask your blessing as we, uh, as we read your word. Amen. All right, so if you will, look at John 4, and I'll just read, and we'll kind of do one section at a time. So first we'll do verses 1 through 15. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, which in those days would have been kind of high noon. And when it's hot, when people rest, obviously Jesus is weary from the journey, um, but not a lot of people are gonna be outside at this time, especially in, in, the, in the desert. So a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? John explains to us here, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We'll get into more of that here in a second. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, 
and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So in, in this first section, I think we see something, uh, obviously, just a very compelling uh, narrative as we read it. Uh, there's a lot of elements here, right? And I'll try to cover some of those to highlight what's happening. So uh, Jesus obviously is leaving the region of Judea. He's going to Galilee, his kind of home, home turf. And on the way, he's going through Samaria. There is a background with the people of Samaria. Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews. Uh, there is a religious and ethnic tension, right? The Samaritans were viewed as, uh, as, as a half-breed, as heretics. And so they're, they're, this is not a happy place to be, but they stop here because they have to. And Jesus is left alone with this woman. And it is clear in the context, and we'll see more here in a second when we get to the next section, that this woman is, is, is kind of an odd, in an odd position. Why is she coming out to the well in the middle of the day? Women traditionally would have gotten water early in the morning before it was hot, right? Maybe right after the sun had risen. And they would take it and they would do their, their, their dealings at home. This woman is coming at noon. This is the, the least convenient and the, the, the time when no one really comes. Why is that? Well, it's because she's a woman who has a past. And so this is very, very uh, obvious, especially in the context of John's gospel. Jesus is encountering this woman who's far from God. And he's going to reveal more of what he knows here in a minute. The previous chapter is all about... Nicodemus, who is a Jew of Jews, who is a religious Pharisee, who is the one who should know God the most. And Jesus challenges Nicodemus in, in the previous chapter, uh, telling him that you have to be born from above in order to enter God's kingdom. And he, the one who has maybe a, like a person like me, has this knowledge and education about religion and theology. He's the one furthest from understanding. He, he, he responds to Jesus in doubt. Well, here we're going to see another story of a woman who was the opposite, who was unclean, who was unwelcome, who was unworthy, and certainly not someone Jesus should be talking to. But, but rather than the way that Nicodemus responds to Jesus with disbelief and doubt, although she does have a little bit of resistance, and we're going to see that, Jesus directly offers her something. Living water. What, what is he talking about? Living water. There's, there's several passages in the Old Testament that allude to this. I'll just read a few. These are, these are from Jeremiah chapter 2 and Isaiah 55. This is Jeremiah chapter 2. It says, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And they have hewed out, kind of carved out, their own cisterns, a vessel, right? Uh, for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Here's another passage, Isaiah 55. Hear this, this call that God has in the Old Testament to people to hear and, and come and listen to him, right? He's offering something. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Underline that word, satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. So what is this living water? It's it's God's offer of his Holy Spirit, his presence. And, and God talks about it in these ways, that it, it is the only thing that can satisfy you and I 
with our hearts the way he has made them. But the reality, so this is kind of number one principle we see about biblical worship. God offers this source that never fails. This living water would have, would have given the image to her of a, a spring that, that was live, right? Water that could be drunk. And, and he says uh, it, would not, it would not go out, but it would actually even well up into eternal life, right? And so God is, is the God who offers generously his presence that brings life and refreshes and satisfies the deepest eternal desires in your heart. So there's this new source that Jesus is offering. But the reality is, is that because of sin, you and I and God's people in the Old Testament, people who had the right rules, who had all the right things that, that should have told them who God was and how to honor him, they chose to try to seek out their own sources of satisfaction. This is what the Bible calls idolatry. And this is what Jesus is fighting against when he's saying, I'm, I'm offering this living water. He's saying there is a newness, there is a source that will never run dry that can satisfy you in all those things that you're looking for in your life to satisfy you, those idols, those good things that you're turning into things that to replace God. Uh, those things are worthless. You'll be thirsty tomorrow. You'll be thirsty in a minute, but I'm offering living water. So we see this, that worship in the biblical sense has to begin with a desire for a new source. There has to be a thirst in us. And we have to see Jesus offering to quench that thirst. So how do we get there? How do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, look at the next section here, verses 16 through 18. So the woman obviously responds saying, okay. It's clear though, she doesn't get it. She doesn't quite understand what he's saying and you'll see that. So verse 16, Jesus says to her, go call your husband, come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right. In saying, I have no husband for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Uh, here, I think we see a new start. Biblical worship is concerned with people like you and me, with our, with our shame and our sin, experiencing a new start. Uh, this woman, as we, as we said, she's coming out to the well in the middle of the day. And here Jesus confirms that he knows the reason why. The reason she's coming out in the middle of the day is that she has a past. She has had five husbands. She is now living with a man who is not her husband. Uh, and she is coming out in the middle of the day to avoid the shame of being in public with the other woman, women who would look at her as a sinner and an outcast. And it's easy to think here, I mean, is Jesus being harsh? Is he being harsh and kind of pointing out her, her, her problems? Isn't Jesus supposed to be loving and, and always empathetic? I think we have to see here that Jesus is not pointing her sin out uh, to lord it over her. Just as God does not reveal us our sins in order to lord our sin over us and say, look at what you've done. But instead, it's clear that she doesn't yet realize the need that she has. She doesn't yet realize that all of these relationships she's been pursuing, all these things she's been living for, all this, uh, this just mess in her life is because she has been going to other sources for her satisfaction instead of God alone. And Jesus wants her to realize that. We see this all through the Bible. Biblical worship is all about people who realize they're broken, who, who have resistance like all of us. We have resistance in our hearts at really truly being exposed, but God would open our hearts and allow us to see ourselves for who we are in our brokenness and the fact that we're not worthy, we're not lovely. And yet, once we see that, to realize that he is speaking to us in love with the thing that he offers that would actually make us satisfied and make us worthy. And so he's calling, calling her out of her, her isolation and sin and brokenness and he wants her to see that he has a new start for her and that this new start would lead her to verses 19 through 25, a new kind of service. Look at verses 19 through 25. So the woman clearly uncomfortable uh, with this switches the subject, right? This is what we do when someone pushes our buttons, we switch the subject. So she says, uh, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem, 
is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So here I believe we see Jesus revealing uh, a profound and, and kind of game-changing reality that he is bringing uh, in his life, in his, at this point, future death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, which is that he has come, and he's revealing to this woman in answer of her question, he has come not just to settle religious disputes about who's right, and he does acknowledge here, the Samaritans had the wrong idea. They, they believed that worship should happen on Mount Gerizim, which is where Abraham first built an altar all the way back in Genesis. Um, and the Jews obviously had the temple in Jerusalem. The Jews actually destroyed the temple at Mount Gerizim of the Samaritans in the second century BC. So again, the animosity they have here. But Jesus is saying, look, he gives her the answer and says, well, no, you, you're wrong. You have the wrong foundation. There's error in your religion. He's not saying religion doesn't matter, but he's saying, look, the fulfillment of the true religion, right, of, of the Jewish understanding of temple and, and being in Jerusalem, well, even that is, is moving forward with me being on the scene. Now there is going to be a new kind of service. This, this word service is a, is a worship word all throughout the Bible. There's really several kind of worship terms. One of the key terms you'll see all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that translates into worship really is this term to serve. And you think of the priests in the temple, they were serving, they had a priestly service. And the idea here, the picture is of being in God's presence, right? Ministering in God's presence. So receiving, again, think about this living water, receiving life from him, responding to that revelation, that, 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 that power from his spirit, that grace with service, teaching, uh, people to know God, living in a way that is harmonious with his law, his will. And Jesus is, is, is making a huge revelation here to a woman so far from God who probably needs it the most. And he's saying there is a new kind of service. The time is coming and is now here in me, Jesus says. When this external worship, these external rituals and rites, and pilgrimages and all these things that are wrapped up with the cultic life of Israel. All those things had a purpose and the purpose is now completed in my presence here because God in the flesh, the word of God, look at John chapter one, the light of the world, the lamb of God has come. God's presence is now on earth. It's no longer uh, in a sense limited to the temple and the day of atonement and just the high priest can enter God's presence, which even in the Old Testament was clear. The temple was not thought of as, as a place that would contain God's presence, just as a place where God had ordained that people meet with him. And now Jesus is saying there is a new kind of priestly service and it's for all who would believe in him. And it would be wherever Jesus's presence is, not in a building, not in these external things. And again, don't, don't notice, don't miss the critical detail here that here he is talking to someone who is ritually unclean, who is impure, who is sinful and deserves to die for her sin, just like you and I. And yet he is speaking with grace, including her and offering her his presence and fellowship. This is the new kind of service in the new temple of people who are sinners who could be redeemed to serve the Lord uh, despite their past and their sin and shame. Look at verses 25 and 26 as we get a little closer to the end here. So the woman says to him, I know Messiah is coming. Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. And we won't read the, the rest of this, but in the context, 
Jesus' disciples come and they question him, what were you doing talking to that woman? She runs off and she goes to all of her, her hometown uh, neighbors and tells them about this man who, the quote is, this man who told me everything I ever did. That's a loaded statement. No longer hiding from other people. She has gone and has begun to proclaim already her great testimony of her newfound savior. She says, can this man really be the Christ? And in, in John's gospel, it's clear. The response is that people from that town, many of them believe in Jesus because of this woman's testimony. And so we see another principle of worship is that uh, this new priestly service that Jesus would offer to her to have a relationship with him, to know him, to have God's presence in her midst, even though she's a sinner, leads her to joyfully run and proclaim her new story of her Savior and the song that he has put on her heart. And people begin to believe and trust in Jesus. Uh, we see that this, this, this progression, this woman's uh, understanding, right? She begins with a little bit of a indignation at Jesus of, Ooh, why are you talking to me? And as, as God's grace is revealed to her, as Jesus offers her this living water, a transformation happens where her story becomes that she is a person who is now uh, testifying. She's no longer resisting, hiding in her sin, avoiding hard questions. She is, she is facing Jesus and she is seeing who he is. So, so what are some implications we can get uh, about biblical worship from this? I always, I, there's, an, there's a fun kind of TV show my kids used to watch, and they had this song, it's like, who, what, why, how, who, what, where, when, why, how. So I'm thinking, okay, who, right? We're, gonna, we're just going to run through this list, right? Who, who is worship, who is worship involved? Biblical worship is not for just a certain class of people. It is not just for good people. It is not just for people who have all the right answers. Nicodemus, again, in the previous chapter, has the right answers and yet just looks at Jesus in unbelief and, and, and doubt. Although he later becomes a believer, we, we know in, in John's gospel. Uh, so it's not divine by background. Worship is not defined by being an insider, a religious, knowledgeable person, but it's defined by Jesus and all of those who are in him, all of those who trust in him by grace through faith. Worship is an offer for every person on this earth who would hear that word, hear that message, that gospel, and respond in faith and say, yes, Lord, I'll take that living water. What is worship? It's not just a song, right? It's not just a ritual. It's not even just a, a service in the sense of the way we use that word nowadays. Worship is a redeemed life. We see this woman's transformed story. It's a redeemed life. It's worship in spirit and truth, no longer living according to old, dead ways, but living in the new and living way that's been opened up by Jesus and his blood. Where? Where do you find worship? You find worship throughout the whole world, in every nation and language, as Jesus has told us to do, to go into every people group and, and language and nation and proclaim the gospel. And so worship is no longer limited to what would have been in the mind of the Jew of the day. Uh, these cultic activities, these, these celebrations, these feasts at the temple, uh, most of all, uh, no longer is it, is it to be viewed that way, but worship is to be viewed as being where God's presence is, where Jesus is proclaimed and obeyed. There is God's presence and there is biblical worship as people follow him. When, when is worship? When should we think about ourselves as being worshiping? It's clear, it's not, it's not just on Sundays. It's, it's all of life. It's every moment living for the glory of God. Sundays and gatherings do matter, but the reason we go to Sunday church really is a, is a really important question. Why do you go to church? The answer should be this, that you've experienced this newness of life, or maybe you're a seeker and that's good, you're coming to learn. But if you're a Christian, the reason you go to church is because God has put a new story and a new song in your heart. You have been redeemed by Christ. And the natural response is that you want to be with his people. You want to be with his people. You want to talk about and testify of what he's done in your life. You want to learn more and grow. 
It's not just about Sundays, but Sundays exist because disciples have always gathered to share in the grace of God together in the gifts that he has given us. Why? Why worship? Why is this? It's because it's what we were made for. Worship, having God's presence living within our hearts is what God made us for. It's why he created the world was that he might fill the world with people who walk in his truth, who are filled with his spirit, who are finding their deepest satisfaction in him. And that as people would trust in him and, and live this embodied all of life worship, that they would fill the earth with his glory. Look the, through the entire Bible. That is the story of the Bible. That is the story of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were meant to be priests in God's temple. The, the language there of what God calls Adam and Eve to do is priestly language that's used later in the Bible. They were to extend his glory and his presence as they served him and as they worshiped, as they tended the garden, as they listened to his word, and as they followed him and were fruitful and multiplied more and more people to proclaim his greatness. How does this happen for us? It's by spirit and truth, by his presence within our hearts, through faith in Christ. So he, here's our application. As we, as we say, okay, if this is the big picture, or one way to talk about the big picture of worship, how do we apply this? And I think for Christians, uh, there's, there's really kind of focusing on this idea of spirit and truth. There's really two things we need to focus on in our daily lives, is that we remain in the truth of God's word, and that we walk by his spirit. But the Bible says, keep in step with the spirit. We look at worship and spirit, right? What, is, what does Jesus mean when he says worship and spirit and truth? Uh, on the side of, of spirit, obviously, he, in John's gospel, it's going to become very clear. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus, right? When Jesus ascends to heaven, he says, hey, I'm not going to leave you. He, he reassures his disciples, I'll be with you. I'm not, it'll be even better that I leave so that the spirit, the comforter, may come and may dwell in your hearts. He will teach you. He will lead you. He will guide you. Uh, we see Jesus in, in the gospels. Uh, very concerned about the spiritual nature of true worship. Uh, and, and a few ways to sum it up, we look at humility. Humility is a, is a huge emphasis. People being humble. And, and the, the warning that he has is that hypocrisy is a very real and, and constant danger for people who would claim to be God's people. He warns against people who, he warns against becoming a person who's so engaged with the eyes of the world, living for external things, for the praise of man. And he, and he contrasts that with the disciple who is to be worshiping in spirit and truth, who is humble, who is seeking only the father's attention, right? The father is seeking these people, right? This is a person who realizes God's eyes are looking around and looking for this person who would look to him and just look for his attention, his appreciation. So a person who who walks by the Spirit is a person who is seeking humility. They're not seeking the admiration of, of other people and the applause of the world, but they're seeking God and Him alone, seeking after His heart. That is very important for us. How quick are you and I to seek other things, to not look to the living water, but to find our satisfaction elsewhere? Paul says, walk by the Spirit so that you do not gratify the desires of the flesh for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the kind of life that is a life that's pleasing to God, that is a life that is truly by a living faith. What about truth? We cannot forget this, right? We are not just looking for, as KJ has said, inspiration in our fortune cookies. We are not looking for moments where uh, we're ignoring God's word and just only waiting for some kind of tangible word that we hear out loud. A worshiping life that's centered on God's word is a, is a worshiping life that is in truth. It's God's word applied to all of life. The criticism that God has in the Old Testament of those who, who just continued to rebel against him is that their heart was hardened and it resisted his authority constantly resisted his pleas of, of just to listen, as you saw in Jeremiah chapter 2. Well, a redeemed heart gladly hears and receives God's word. In Jeremiah 31, 
the promise is that this renewed heart, God says, I'll put a new heart in you and my word will be in your heart. The word becomes no longer an external thing that we give lip service to or totally reject. It becomes a thing deep in our hearts that satisfies us and renews us. Paul says in Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we see that this, as far as how we respond to this, we remain and we rest in God's truth, his word, and we walk by the spirit. And it's that simple. That is a, that is a dynamic life of a worshiper. It's, it's every day. It's every moment. It's not just reserved for Sundays. It's not just paying lip service and putting a scripture on a coffee mug and saying that's good. It's, it's yielding our entire lives to the Lord because we believe that our joy and our satisfaction is found in him alone. And we can practice his presence daily because he's with us. Jesus said, I will not leave you. So we, we find our greatest joy and satisfaction in him alone. So just a final word. <clears throat> if you're not a Christian and you're hearing this, thank you for listening. Uh, and, and I think it's a simple call for you is, is to hear this. Maybe, maybe even identify as a Christian, but maybe you're realizing as you hear this that your life is not marked by this newness that, that Jesus is talking about, that he's promising. Well, here's, here's the answer. Hear Jesus' voice. He, would have, he, he said he'll give you living water. He'll gladly give you living water as you turn to him. Hear Jesus' voice today and see that he's offering it to you. Hear, hear constant scriptures that are proclaiming this truth, that God is gladly going to give this gift of grace to satisfy your deepest longings. Turn away from all those vain things, all those things that you think satisfy you, that you know always leave you thirsty, and trust in him. Say to him, I need you, Lord, and I will gladly trade my life of sin and shame to receive your eternal life through what Jesus has done for me on the cross and his resurrection. If you're a Christian, you know, it's interesting. I think we have a lot that we can talk about and we will talk about um, as we have our home groups this week about the fact that a, there's two things, right? The positive, are we seeking to satisfy our hearts in God alone? And we could talk about a number of areas of our lives where we, we go to other places. We dig out our own little cisterns that cannot hold any water. But here's the question. There's a warning Look at the end of, of 1 John. He says, little children, flee from idols. Idols are those things that come into our lives and our hearts that we think quench our thirst. And as Christians, we have to do the hard work of talking about an honest conversation with one another, confessing our sins and temptations, and asking for each other to pray and, and help us because there are many, many things in this world that try to draw our hearts away from him and prevent us from living our lives for his glory, of experiencing his presence and his fullness. I want to thank you for logging in, and I hope it's been encouraging. I hope I haven't gone too long. I'm just thankful no kids have come in here screaming and yelling. But uh, We love you. We pray uh, for you and uh, hope that you are encouraged today. And I'm just going to close this out in prayer, and we will discuss more of this this week. Thank you again. Father, I pray for uh, those who uh, are listening. Oh, Lord, uh, worship is, is the reality that we're wrapped up in, Lord. It's, it's our life. We are all worshiping. Well, we're worshiping either you by your spirit and in truth, or we are worshiping the things you've created. And we are worshiping the lie. And God, there is no alternative. There are only two ways to live, Lord, by faith or in unbelief. And I pray that there would be Lord, continuing outpouring of your grace uh, on those who hear during this time of confinement of true biblical faith that would lead them, Lord, to worship that truly honors you, that is truly in spirit and truth. And Lord, for those who are caught up in, in finding their satisfaction elsewhere and trying to quench their thirst and their hunger uh, in things other than you, Lord, I pray, Lord, for you to reveal that 
and for them to hear your voice, not, not trying to shame them, but trying to show them, Lord, uh, Lord, that you alone can satisfy. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we now pray. Amen. All right, thank you all. We'll see you soon.